So our last talk no, was under being made for the session this afternoon. The one you just said there, the chip one you want to use is uh, Mark Powell from, uh, from Wisconsin with ARS. And uh, he's going to talk to us about what dairy cows are fed, impacts manure chemistry, <coughs> and the environment. So with that, we'll go ahead and get going. Well, good afternoon. I hope uh, everyone got some food because I only know infants that fall asleep into their food. <laughs> so uh, it's good. Keep joining. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge Glenn Broderick. He's a dairy nutritionist, and I've had the privilege uh, to be associated with three uh, excellent animal nutritionists uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. And what I'm going to do is present some of the research that uh, we've done on this topic. So why, why do we uh, do this research? Well, uh, manure management, as we all know, has been implicated in two legislative um, initiatives uh, by US EPA. One is the Clean Water Act. And as we mem remember, about 10 years ago, phosphorus was uh, very important and evading uh, phosphorus runoff from agricultural land was incorporated into the Clean Air Act and the focus was on manure phosphorus. And then the Clean Air Act, which was, uh, oh, about eight years ago, uh, brought our awareness to ammonia emissions from animal agriculture. And um, so it was really focused on what can we do to abate ammonia emissions from animal agriculture. And then more recently, we have uh, yet another focus on animal agriculture, this is the impact of animals on uh, global climate change. And the focus here has been on carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So I'm going to be talking about phosphorus, I'm going to be talking about ammonia, I'm going to be talking about carbon dioxide, methane, uh, not so much about carbon dioxide or methane, but uh, about uh, N2, N2O. <coughs> So just a couple summary points right in the beginning is that, uh, as I said, I was, I've been associated with three animal nutritionists. Uh, perhaps some of you remember the late Larry Satter. I uh, did the phosphorus work with Larry. And uh, have since I've uh, been working with Glenn Broderick and Michelle Watio on, um, on dietary uh, crude protein. And uh, so basically, I don't uh, do the trials in order to obtain the manure. I just depend my work onto the back end of the animal. So they do all of the, um, uh, the impacts of, of the diets on, uh, on animal performance and all the things that, that a dairy nutritionist would be involved with. And then us as soil scientists, we can take the manure and look at the chemistry and look at the impact of management decisions on some of these environmental impacts. So uh, not a dairy nutritionist, and we had, these trials were not conducted for the purpose of looking at environmental impact, but we were able to uh, attach ourselves to these trials in order to accomplish that. So all the diets that I'm going to, rep, uh, that, uh, I'm going to present are representative of what is fed on commercial dairy operations in Wisconsin. We've been working with commercial dairy operators for the last oh, 15 years, uh, again, about 12 years ago, uh, looking at dietary phosphorus and did a lot of survey work on dietary phosphorus and, and manure phosphorus. Um, so the diets that I'm going to be showing are within the range of what's being fed. And very few of the diets uh, that I'm going to be showing had any impact on the animal. It only impacted manure, uh, manure nutrients, the chemistry of manure, and the environmental impact. So uh, there's, there's great things that can be done on the front end of the animal in order to mitigate what happens uh, on the back end. So if we look at nutrients in the environment, just kind of as a summary slide, so phosphorus really uh, is, is a runoff issue and it comes under the Clean Water Act. So uh, our response to some of the challenges farmers face with the new implementation of phosphorus management strategies, it was in response to the uh, Clean Water Act. When we look at nitrogen, we have leaching um, that's also associated with the Clean Water Act. If we look at ammonia volatilization, uh, that is associated with the Clean Air Act. And denitrification is, is associated with this global climate change greenhouse gases. 
And then in terms of carbon that comes out of the animal, manure carbon, it's associated with uh, methane emissions, and we've uh, heard about some of that, and that's related to global climate change. And uh, also carbon, we have soil, uh, soil carbon fluxes, carbon dioxide fluxes from the soil, also affected with uh, global climate change. So I'm gonna be kind of addressing these issues um, kind of sequentially. Uh, just to let you know how this, you know, how the chronology of this, we started this work Oh, back in uh, oh, 1988, uh, 1998, 1999, when phosphorus, manure phosphorus became an important issue. And we did that research for about four years, again, pretty intensely with, um, with dairy producers. And then, oh, for the last 10 years or so, we've kind of shift gears. We don't do uh, too much research with phosphorus. That's when we started looking at ammonia losses and what we can do on the front end of the animal to evade ammonia losses. And then through time, we got into the dietary impact on the chemist carbon and nitrogen chemistry of the manure, and that, how that impact carbon and nitrogen transformation in the soil, and, um, and then the plant response that we could associate back to the diet. So diet, manure, uh, soil, carbon, nitrogen, and plant response. Now, more recently, in the last uh, two or three years, uh, I've been working with Al Rotz, um, and others uh, to look at the interactions between uh, dietary crude protein, well, basically urea, urea cycling through dairy farms, starting at with dietary crude protein, and then how that dietary crude protein is converted into urea in the animal, how it ends up in the blood, ends up in the milk, ends up in the urine. So can we use milk urea nitrogen as an indicator for ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions? So, um, I'll be presenting a little bit of, of each one. So just to kind of a 101 uh, dairy nutrition, if we look at what animals are, are fed, um, about 45 to 65% of the diet uh, fed to a dairy cow is forage, uh, 20 to 30% is grain, protein supplement, 20 to 30% of the dry matter intake, and then one to 2% is uh, minerals. And uh, I contend that animals are manure producers. Milk's the byproduct, but they don't get paid for manure. Uh, but 65 to 80% of feed carbon, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus comes out in manure. And uh, only 20 to 35% come out in milk on, uh, on commercial dairy farms. That's kind of the biology of the animal. So let's look at these components and look at what the impact that they have on the chemistry of the manure uh, first. So if we look at uh, the minerals, that little slice of minerals, that's, uh, that is, is really the phosphorus uh, part of the equation, and that affects fecal phosphorus and the soluble fraction of the phosphorus in the feces. And if we look at the forage and the protein supplement, well, if we look at the nitrogen component, of, of those two diet components. We see it impacts the nitrogen in the feces and the nitrogen in the, in the urine, so the ratio of the two. It affects, uh, there's two pools of nitrogen in the feces. There's a pool that is of animal origin, uh, microbial, bacteria, <laughs> tissue. That's about 80% of fecal nitrogen, but get, that can vary uh, between 70 and 90%. And then there is fiber nitrogen. So it's the fiber that was not digested by the rumen microorganisms. So it's the fiber in the manure. Now those two nitrogen sources behave very differently in soil systems. The fiber that comes out of dairy cows is uh, the rumen microbes didn't digest it. The soil microbes don't digest it. It's an important component of soil organic matter. It plays an important role in uh, carbon sequestration. And if we look at carbon, uh, grain, and uh, also the forage component affect, affect the carbon chemistry of the manure. And it's, uh, so it's the structural carbohydrate in the manure or the non-structural carbohydrate. And that impacts the stimulation of microbes in the soil. So the carbon dynamics in the soil can be related back to the forage and back to the, um, to the grain supplement. I'll show some of that information. Mark. Should phosphorus, I mean, there's phosphorus in forage or Right, but what I'm showing is what our research is. Yeah, so there is phosphorus in the other components, but 
What I'm saying is, um, what I'm just trying to show is that if, so what is the impact of mineral phosphorus on some of these environmental outcomes? Yeah, but you're certainly, certainly correct on that one. So let's start with the phosphorus story. And this was the response to this uh, Clean Water Act, and this was done in the late 90s, um, early uh, at the turn of the century. So uh, it impacts uh, phosphorus excreted in the feces, which impacts how much land the farmer needs to spread manure. It impacts uh, soil test phosphorus, and it also impacts runoff phosphorus. So uh, I'm going to bring your attention to the y-axis. This is dietary phosphorus, and the next three or four slides are going to have the same axis. So what happens? Here is the requirement, 0.35, for high-producing lactating cows. Most of our producers were feeding this amount, and what happens is the animals just, it comes out in the feces, it doesn't come out in the urine, and what it comes out as uh, mineral phosphorus comes out as soluble phosphorus. So we're getting an increase in total phosphorus, and all of that increase is water-soluble phosphorus. Now what happens is when we apply that manure to crop land, a, phosph a phosphorus adequate diet versus a phosphorus uh, diet that the, that, the animal, uh, that the farmers are feeding to the animals, we get a tremendous increase in runoff from uh, manure amended with uh, manure, uh, manure that came from the two different diets. So a high phosphorus diet, excess phosphorus, it's coming off in uh, runoff. And also what happens, uh, again, is dietary phosphorus increases above requirement. This is what farmers were feeding. In terms of their comprehensive nutrient management planning, they needed twice the amount of acres on a phosphorus-based strategy to get that uh, manure phosphorus recycled. And if you were to continue on a, on a nitrogen uh, basis, if you were to continue to apply your uh, uh, manure on a nitrogen basis, here's the impact of the diet again. As you go, as you exceed diet, more phosphorus is coming out in the manure and you're increasing soil test phosphorus up to two parts per million of Brayvon P per year. So that dietary excess dietary phosphorus coming out of soluble phosphorus, increase in the runoff, and increase in soil test phosphorus. Um, Jay Ham uh, talked about this, and I agree. It's, a, it's, such a, it's, it's a very uh, interesting study. If you haven't read it, this is a really good one. Uh, the reason for this is that we have seen phosphorus, we've seen ammonia, we've seen greenhouse gases, nitrogen is the next story for animal agriculture, for all of agriculture. There's a, a, a more, uh, more and more focus is putting on uh, reactive nitrogen in the environment and trying to reduce reactive nitrogen and uh, animal agriculture is right at the forefront of that with uh, ammonia and some of these other reactive components. So um, get ready, here comes nitrogen. <laughs> in terms of what we're going to be talking about in the next few years. We've done a little bit of work on uh, the impact of uh, protein supplement on, again, how much nitrogen comes out in the feces and the urine, how much, of, uh, urinary, how much of urinary nitrogen is urea. It can be anywhere from 40 to 80%, depending on the diet. Uh, and then how that affects, uh, impacts ammonia emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, how it impacts the nitrogen turnover when the feces hit the soil, and then how the plants respond to the nitrogen in the feces that was derived from different protein levels or different protein sources. So uh, if you look in this bottom graph, this is nitrogen intake by the cow, and this is our 30, 35% of that nitrogen going into milk. As we increase above requirement, we go from uh, kind of maximum efficiency down to very low efficiency. We lose efficiency, and the animals just urinate it out. Now, depending on the protein source, I'll get into that a little bit, but the protein source will not only increase urinary nitrogen, but it increases the proportion of that, ur of that uh, urinary nitrogen that comes out as urine, uh, as urea. So, let's look. What happens about feeding uh, pro fruit protein? You gave me this pointer, I haven't even used it. <laughs> so here's the fruit protein adequate diet and fruit protein excess diet. 
Again, the animals are just peeing, are just, um, it's increasing nitrogen excretion. And if you look at the relative proportion that's coming out in urine versus feces, uh, the animals are just urinating that excess nitrogen out. And then what happens when we apply it to the soil, just like the phosphorus story, when we apply manure derived from a high crude protein diet, it is coming off as ammonia versus, uh, so two to three fold times more ammonia coming off the soil uh, from uh, manure derived from a, a protein excess diet. Uh, but there are trade-offs, okay? Urea is a good thing for plants. So what happens is, so after we find that all of our ammonia has been lost from the soil, we have more plant available uh, nitrogen in the soil if the manure came from, from a protein um, high diet. So, um, and then this is also depicted in here. So this is uh, whole manure, slurry, applied to the soil. So we have more nitrogen in the soil from the high protein diet. And this is feces in the soil over a, three, over a year period. The high uh, feces derived from the high protein diet are releasing nitrogen in the soil. The soil microorganisms are releasing more inorganic nitrogen than the feces derived from the low crude protein diet. Plant uptake. Plants also respond to the high crude protein diet okay, or manure derived from the high crude protein diet. So, so there are trade-offs. You reduce dietary phosphorus, you reduce nitrogen is, a, is just a bunch of trade-offs. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get off. So if, if you reduce dietary phosphorus, doesn't affect the animal, you reduce ammonia emissions, then it's time to look at the, the fertilizer value of, of that manure also decreases. Uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, urea. This is work that I'm doing uh, currently with Al Rocks. So uh, here's the animal component, and not to get too far uh, into that, but if you look at dietary nitrogen, the animals take it in, it goes into the rumen, the intestine, Ammonia and amino acids go into the liver. Uh, that's where urea is synthesized. Some of that urea goes back and is recycled in the animal. But that urea is part, is, um, goes into the bloodstream and it's partitioned into the udder, comes out as, milk, as urea in the milk, or it goes in the bloodstream from the kidney and comes out as urinary nitrogen. Now like, what I would like to show you here is that there's a strong relationship between the urea in the blood, the urea in the milk, and urea in the urine. So the urea in the blood or the urea in the milk is a very good predictor of urea in the urine. And um, so that being the main source, so we take the urea and we put that through our systems, barn, manure, storage, and soils, and it's hydrolyzed uh, with the urea enzyme. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impact of tannin on decreasing uh, urease activity. I'll get to that a little bit, but anyway, uh, the urea, uh, urease enzyme convert that to ammonium, and then we lose it as NH3. Some of it comes back down into our terrestrial systems as an indirect source of uh, N2O. So what I'd like to do now, just for a few slides, is look at this interaction between dietary nitrogen, urea in the milk, urea in the urine, and uh, ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions from uh, various components of a dairy farm. This shows the relationship. So here we have milk, urea, and nitrogen. And these are values that most commercial dairy operators get as part of their, uh, because they use it to refine rations, high milk, urea, and nitrogen. Farmers refine rations, lower crude protein, increase energy, balance the rations. So they, they have this information. Uh, what happens as milk, urea, and nitrogen increases, it shows uh, there's a direct relationship with uh, uh, urine, a uh, urea in the urine, and it's all related to crude protein in the diet. So I didn't show the relationship, but as crude protein in the diet increases 20% from 15 to 20%, milk, urea, nitrogen increases, and urinary nitrogen increases. It's all kind of an equilibrium and reflects each other. So let's look at uh, 197 herds in Wisconsin, about 38,000 uh, cows. If we look at the milk, urea, nitrogen concentration of these cows, this is the desirable 
milky rate of nitrogen range from 10 to 12 is, is a good number. That's what dairy farmers are trying to achieve. But we find that 53 to 73, uh, 53 to 73 percent of these cows are being overfed uh, crude protein. So what happens is as milk urea nitrogen increases, urinary urea increases, and we get increases in ammonia emissions. This is on a whole, whole farm basis. This is all of the components of the dairy farm. And we get increases in nitrous oxide uh, emissions. So this is of, uh, of the urinary urea nitrogen, how much is lost is ammonia, and how much is lost is nitrous oxide. So on Wisconsin dairy farms, if we feed balanced rations, in order to get that NUN desired range of 12 to 10 milliliter, uh, milligrams per deciliter, it would reduce ammonia emissions by 35 to 42%, and it re would reduce nitrous oxide by 18 to 21%. And what it's directly getting at is the source of these air, uh, air pollutants, and that is urea in the urine, which can be monitored and modified with milk urea nitrogen because that's the baseline for measuring how much crude protein is actually being uh, consumed. So I just want to end up with the forage story. We've done considerable work on uh, what happens when we feed corn silage versus alfalfa silage versus alfalfa uh, birds for tree foil that has tannins in it or adding supplementary tannins to the diet. How does that impact the, uh, my, the microbial nitrogen in the feces? How it impacts the fiber nitrogen in the feces? And how that impacts the nitrogen uh, mineralization in the soil? And how that infects, uh, impacts the nitrogen taken up by a crop? Um, and I'll just end with a few of those slides. Now, uh, this is corn silage diets fed at a low crude protein or high crude protein, and this is alfalfa silage, and this is some of the chemistry. Now, NDIN is the nitrogen that's associated with the fiber, so it was the undigested nitrogen uh, that's, a, that's still holding onto the fiber. So um, this is from 8% to 5%. But it makes a big difference when, at least uh, to the soil microbial population. And I'd like to bring your attention to the carbon-nitrogen ratio. For soil scientists, this is something that we uh, keep track of. But we usually say that things over 20%, 20 carbon-nitrogen ratio will immobilize nitrogen in the soil. The soil microbes will tie up nitrogen as they uh, mineralize the nitrogen. And anything below, they actually mineralize nitrogen. So we have a very narrow range of carbon to nitrogen ratio, but we found that the carbon in the feces, uh, it, it's, um, it's soluble carbon, or it's hemicellulose, or it's cellulose. So the composition of the carbon can be uh, tremendously impacted by the type of forage that's being fed to the dairy cow. And that impacts the uh, mineralization of that carbon in the soil and carbon sequestration. So if we just look at uh, two diets, one is 100% corn silage, so this is all corn silage. Remember the animal is consuming about 55% of its dry matter intake or 60% as forage. So this is if it's all corn silage or a half corn silage and half alfalfa silage. And this is uh, nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen produced by the soil microbes. When you put the feces in the soil, the soil microbes break it down and make it into plant available nitrogen or organic uh, nitrogen. So what happens is that corn silage is really what we call immobilizing nitrogen in the soil. It is, um, the, soil, the soil microbes aren't giving up nitrogen, they're taking nitrogen in order to break down that carbon. So they're having a diff more difficult time breaking down the carbon. And one of the really big surprises in this research is how plants um, responded to it. So we're getting much higher yields if the feces were derived from alfalfa silage versus if the feces were derived from corn silage. So that, corn, uh, that manure derived from corn silage is really tying up um, soil nitrogen, which can be overcome with fertilizer nitrogen, but there is an impact. The soil microbes are 
are um, responding to it. Now, I'd just like to get back to this carbon-nitrogen ratio. So it's the amount of carbon versus the amount of nitrogen in the feces. And this is a really narrow range, 14 to 18. It is a very narrow range for, uh, for us to consider in soil systems. But we've really got a really good relationship between, as there's more carbon in the feces, related back to the forage in the diet, uh, we're getting less nitrogen taken up by the subsequent crops. So um, again, it gets back to the chemistry of the carbon, which we can relate back to, to the diet. And I have just a couple slides on forage tannin. So tannins are polyphenolic compounds that, uh, that can bind uh, protein and make it pass through the rumen. So it's bypass protein, and the animals make more efficient use of it if it gets through the rumen and is this is uh, Dairy and Nutrition 101, but, uh, but anyway, so it has a binding effect. It also has a toxic effect, perhaps, on uh, rumen microbes. But nonetheless, if we fed, fed our alfalfa versus bird foot's tree form with low tannin or high tannin, and just look at the high tannin. So the high tannin diet, again, we're getting, we're, we're getting more nitrogen excreted but we're getting more of that nitrogen excreted as fecal nitrogen, less as urinary nitrogen. And then when we put that manure through storage, through our storage systems and then apply it, we find that the tannin is, um, because of its impact on urinary urea nitrogen, because of its reduction in that, we're getting less of uh, ammonia loss when we have tannin in the diet. And one thing we discovered last year is that the tannin is also inhibiting urease. Um, so we have uh, organic nitrogen, and then we have uh, urinary nitrogen, and then the urease enzymes uh, hydrolyze that to ammonia. So the urease enzyme are, are the vector for, uh, for, for hydrolyzing that and uh, for creating the ammonia. Now, when we added uh, cabraco and uh, chestnut tannin to the diet, and then we took the feces derived from animals, fed the little, uh, the, the different tannin levels. We found that um, the urease, uh, the tannin was actually depressing urease activity in the feces. So the tannins were coming through. They were not only reducing urinary urea in, in, in the urine, but they were also getting into the feces to decrease urease activity. So, two positive impacts of tannin, one decreasing urinary urea nitrogen and also decreasing uh, urease enzyme in the, in the, in the feces. So uh, summary points is that minerals, protein supplements and forages impact the chemistry of the manure, phosphorus, nitrogen and carbon excretions and their transformation in water, air and soil. Uh, I didn't show this, but dietary phosphorus can be monitored using fecal phosphorus, and the people at Penn State are looking at this, and it was great to see that. Um, <coughs> dietary nitrogen can be monitored and modified using milk urea nitrogen. That dairy rations can be uh, formulated to satisfy the demands for high-producing dairy cows, but yet at the same time produce excreta that's less susceptible to loss in the environment. And in many situations, these are win-win strategies, not in all situations, as we saw from uh, a couple of the economic analysis. But in most cases, it, act it can reduce feed costs and also uh, yeah, reduce the environmental impacts of uh, dairy production. Thank you.